Welcome to our first lecture for Anthropology 1140, um, Introduction to Cultural Anthropology. Uh, my name is Dr. Tanya Mueller, and I'm excited about uh, the course this course will take this year. For our first lecture, we'll start with a little bit of background information about me, and then we'll discuss what we mean by anthropology as a discipline um, and how it's relevant in today's world. So we'll start with a little bit about me. Um, I'm a primatologist at heart. That means that um, for my dissertation research, I worked, uh, well, prom predominantly with the baboons that are on the right, but um, I've had field experience both in uh, the actual field um, in uh, Indonesia, Sulawesi, Indonesia, and in Panama, and then did my work with captive baboons. So over on the left, those four photos are from some of the work that I've done in Indonesia. You see a much younger, much thinner me um, pictured in the, the top right picture of that group of four um, with our cook, Jumaria. She was a member of a group called the Bajau, who are also known as sea nomads. Um, bottom left shows the village where we lived. Um, this area was called Tangent Api. It's a national park. And it was called that because there was a certain area of the beach that had natural methane gas vents. And when you would scratch the beach, the beach would catch on fire. So tangent off, means fire point. Um, the bottom right of that group of four is Merlin. She was a, um, a pet um, macaque tonkiana, tonkian macaque. Um, Sulawesi has the, is the hotbed of macaque evolution, so there are 11 different species. She couldn't be released back into the wild, though, because she, her favorite food was Oreo cookies. Her favorite drink was Coca-Cola. And then the top right picture shows some of the small-scale logging that people in the area were using this uh, preserve for, for like firewood needs, etc. Over on the right, we've got some of my beautiful girls from San Antonio, Texas. There's a place in Texas called, that's now called Texas Biomed, but used to be called the Southwest Foundation for, uh, for Biomedical Research. And I was working with those breeding baboons studying adolescent development. So the top right picture shows what females start to uh, undergo when they hit puberty. Um, baboons have estrus swelling cycles where their butt swells up, um, really kind of firm to the touch and, and is tinged pink. The bottom right picture shows that they also have a visible sign of pregnancy. So you're able to measure hormone levels fairly reliably just with a visible indicator. Uh, and then the bottom left shows me doing some growth studies. Uh, these animals were rounded up twice a year for vaccinations. And so during that time, I was able to take crown rump measurements, uh, body weights and uh, percent body fat. My life has changed a bit, uh, particularly over the past year. So I've been teaching at UNM since 2005, started teaching at CNM in 2017, and have since also accepted a full-time science position. So I've got a bachelor's in biology from Virginia Tech uh, with a minor in chemistry. And then I've got my master's and my PhD, both in evolutionary anthropology. Uh, so I have uh, teach now high school biology, chemistry, and physics. Um, so one of the reasons why um, Zach Ardine wanted me to teach this section is because uh, a little less than half of you are in the teacher education program. So some of the things on this is, doesn't apply to all of you, but there will be some times where I kind of tie in this line of anthropological thinking and, and thinking about culture uh, to how that kind of applies in the classroom. So um, I've enjoyed it thus far, uh, pretty unconventional, uh, you know, physics, you see me in the bottom right, we did a, a Neanderthal versus Cro-Magnon uh, smackdown to see whether we could uh, do better with projectile points when we were throwing spears or shooting bows and arrows. So um, just a, a lot of kind of out of the box ways of teaching high school science. All right, so one last thing about me before we get started. Um, I do have Tourette syndrome and that is a neurological disorder that's characterized by um, involuntary motor and vocal tics. It is technically a disability. Um, you won't notice, of course, any of the motor tics because we won't actually see each other during this course. But when I'm recording 
sometimes my vocal tics flare up. And so I don't have the uh, stereotypical coprolalia where I yell expletives, though there have been times in my life where I wished it did. Um, instead, my vocal tics sound like <clears throat> those are the two sounds that you may hear me make while recording. I'm not doing it to be annoying. Um, I'm not sick. I'm not, you know, it's n nothing intentional. Um, it's all due to my Tourette's syndrome. All right, so we're going to start our course uh, discussing the advent of anthropology as a discipline. Humans are naturally curious. They are naturally curious about their about their natural surroundings, you know, the ecology in which they live, the environment. Um, they're also naturally curious about each other. If you've ever seen um, babies, for example, when they see other babies, you know, there's no breaks put on. It's like they go over and they hug and they they're like best of friends right away. So um, one other thing, I do apologize if you hear my kids in the background. Um, they have a really hard time staying quiet while I'm recording. So hopefully the distractions will um, remain at a minimum. Um, anyway, back to this natural curiosity. Uh, you know, humans, as they traveled, as they encountered new things, really wanted to understand kind of how to structure and fit those new ideas, those new observations in their kind of framing of the world. So um, during the Enlightenment, the late 1600s and the 1700s, I mean, this was a time that was rife with uh, scientific advances. We started understanding a germ theory of biology. We started understanding that uh, human reproduction wasn't the matter of the homonucleus or an entirely formed minuscule human in the head of a sperm that the women just provided the womb to grow in. You know, a, a lot of in Newtonian physics, you know, a lot of things really had their root in this age of enlightenment. Um, and anthropology is no exception. During the 1800s, anthropology emerged as an academic discipline that was devoted to the observation and analysis of human variation. Now, this was in a very big way influenced by European imperialism. So unfortunately, the same uh, imperialism and colonialism that gave rise to the extermination of indigenous populations around the world gave rise to anthropology as a discipline. In the mid 19th century, anthropologists became concerned with this uh, pattern of industrialization. Because remember in, in about the 1830s, 1840s, the industrial revolution began in earnest uh, in countries like Britain. And that came with a lot of major cultural changes. The center of production shifted out of the home and into factories. Uh, children were uh, sent for mandatory uh, compulsory public education. Uh, and people moved from their small family units in the countryside to these cities uh, to chase these jobs. So this served really to create professional anthropology to help to counteract some of these societal changes that were coming with industrialization. So anthropologists and other social scientists were concerned with things like urban development and the rise of industry. I mean, we've got we've had great advances since industrialization. Absolutely. Right. We should be uh, members of societies that people shouldn't have to worry about the day-to-day -day production tasks because we've automated a lot of that. Um, and certainly this could be accomplished with some, um, let's say, revolutionary social advances like universal basic income um, that would help us through uh, current crises like the coronavirus pandemic as well, because people wouldn't be losing jobs. Um, but, you know, in, in the U.S., we'll talk about culture this week as well, and we'll talk about some of those traditional values, norms, etc. And, you know, we have in the U.S., we have a fear of anything that uh, harkens of quote unquote socialism, right? Whether that is socialism in like communist thought or whether that is just democratic socialism, kind of like what Bernie Sanders proposed, you know, where we have free college, we have single payer healthcare, we have something along the lines of universal basic income. Um, the second point that social scientists were concerned with was explaining biological variation. 
right? The Age of Enlightenment and then subsequent uh, colonial endeavors brought Europeans into contact with a variety of life forms that they weren't aware of. You know, one of those being people with darker skin color, right? But another one being marsupials. I mean, can you imagine traveling from Britain to Australia as a penal colony and finding kangaroos that carry their babies in their in pouches in their belly? I mean, these were uh, these were new influences, new um, new contacts that really uh, kind of left the need for um, theories to explain this diversity that we saw. So Europeans were fascinated with the biological, the ecological diversity that they found around the world, even the diversity in humanity. Um, and now, unfortunately, when that's coupled with imperialism and the idea that uh, the white it kind of rules all, then that's also coupled with incredible atrocities committed against indigenous populations around the world. Um, and then social scientists were concerned with colonial control and resource exploitation. So viewing the rest of the world not as an environment for diverse creatures worthy all their own, but instead viewing it as raw materials to fuel European conquest and industrialization. Industrialization disrupted both American and European societies by bringing large numbers of rural people into these towns and cities to work in factories. And so, you know, this disrupted the kind of family system as a whole. It broke up families. Uh, it was often uh, young adults that moved to the cities, leaving grandparents at home uh, in the countryside, perhaps to raise children, uh, young families that came to cities, um, individuals who were not poised to inherit. Part of what fueled even the scientific revolution during the Age of Enlightenment was that family sizes were bigger than what inheritance needs uh, were able to cope with. And so this happened as long ago as about 1380 in countries like Portugal, where, you know, you've got finite land because we've got as we shift to agriculture we've got this consolidation of all the wealth in the land holdings you've got these finite resources that you can pass to your offspring so you stop with what we call bilateral partable inheritance you stop endowing both your daughters and your sons with inheritance instead you focus your uh, resources on to one single individual that most often took the form of primogeniture, uh, one single male, the oldest male uh, inheriting the family's estate. So what are you to do with all these extra sons? We didn't see um, lower reproduction because we still had things like a 34% adult mortality rate due to things like the bubonic plague, um, et cetera. We, uh, some of these sons went to fight wars like the Crusades. Um, some of these sons fueled these colonialist ventures. I mean, uh, Christopher Columbus was a latter born son. Um, Cortez de Gama, all the uh, Spanish conquistadors were latter day sons. Um, and some of these sons went to cities, went to universities, um, became people like Galileo, uh, Tycho Brahe, um, others that were responsible for some of these great scientific advances. So the questions that emerged then centered around how society was changing to the, this population influx. We've seen a similar thing really at the root of the development of sociology as a discipline. Historically, anthropology has focused on small-scale, non-literate, non-state level societies, whereas anthropo or sociologists have focused on um, Western industrialized nations. And so studying how European villages and cities were structured, how they perpetuated their cultures, led to questions about how non-Western societies worked as well. So looking at basically the important components of culture and then the way that those important components were passed down from generation to generation. Another advance that strongly influenced the direction that anthropology took was uh, the theory of evolution. Now we most closely associate this with Charles Darwin, um, not because he was the sole or even the original uh, proponent of the theory of evolution. I mean, uh, Charles Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, really planted a lot of those seeds in Charles' mind when he was talking about 
transformation. Uh, and Charles Darwin was influenced by a lot of other people, not the least of which was Alfred Russell Wallace, who independently came up with the idea of evolution by natural selection. Um, but also by Charles Lyell, who was the father of modern day geology, bringing in a component of an evolutionary or geological time scale that was much longer duration than, say, a couple hundred or even a couple thousand years. Uh, Thomas Malthus, who was the father of modern day population demography, who was really plagued with a moral dilemma between uh, I, this idea of an omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, and loving God, um, but the reality of large numbers of poor people who didn't have access to the materials, the material resources necessary for survival. So he didn't understand the amount of suffering that he saw the poor experience, and then through population modeling, convinced himself that reproduction is theoretically infinite, but the capacity of any environment to provide resources is finite, and that then creates competition. So and it sounds an awful lot like what we think of with evolution by natural selection. So evolutionary theories were then subsequently applied to the study of culture. And here's another dark side of historical cultural anthropology. Um, we had this idea that there was unilinear cultural evolution, that society started as, quote unquote, noble savages, um, individuals who were or populations who were environmentally sensitive, but not, quote unquote, civilized, and that the pinnacle of cultural evolution was modern Western culture with opera and ballet and such. And so we still tend to structure the world and we use this as a justification for systemic uh, prejudice and discrimination. We still structure the world as those who are cultured versus those who are not. Um, and we see expressions of culture like the marriage of Figaro as somehow more valid and worthy of study than um, the Kardashians, right? Um, and this is really not the case. All humans have culture and all humans have equally complex cultures um, and an equal kind of genetic basis for expressing culture. And no one form of expression is, uh, is better than the other. Now, one thing we won't talk a lot about a lot in this class is uh, how evolutionary theory kind of applies to humans. We will briefly touch on it. Um, the idea of how we evolved over a span of about six to eight million years. Um, evolution is scientific fact. Okay, I know that a lot of people say, well, evolution is just a theory. I don't believe in evolution because it's just a theory. Um, it's got an abundance of evidence that supports the idea of evolution as fact. The theoretical component of it is uh, evolution by natural selection, the mechanism by which it takes place. And um, in science, theories are robust bodies of evidence that allow you to make predictions about things. Laws and facts don't allow you to make predictions. So gravity exists, right? That's the law of gravity. That doesn't allow you to make predictions about individuals body mass um, on other planets where the value of gravity is different right where we either have a greater gravitational pull or a lesser gravitational pull that's where um, theories come in to help make those explanations and so the same is true of evolution change happens evolution in its most simplest sense is defined as change in gene frequencies over time. We see that even at a modern population level, we've now got like seven strains of coronavirus um, in a mere, matters, or a mere matter of months since uh, the virus was first identified. Uh, so there's no disputing that evolution takes place. The mechanism by which it occurs is where we get this theoretical basis, but do not confuse theory with hypothesis. Okay, um, that's really important to kind of keep in the back of your mind. Your hypothesis is your guess. Your theory is a robust body of evidence. All right, so anthropology thusly has its roots in colonialism. Colonial powers employed anthropologists to understand the indigenous peoples of their colonies. Um, the aim of this was to strengthen the mo mother country, this idea of Kind of what we call manifest destiny, um, that Europe was somehow 
better, more cultured, more worthy of uh, controlling resources at the expense of the local populations that have those resources. And so explaining indigenous populations as somehow being part of the quote unquote other, um, that these othered behaviors were primitive or savage when viewed by administrators and officials. Um, many anthropologists practice what was called salvage anthropology, right? The idea of colonialism is that you either kill off or assimilate those people into the modern dominant culture, which in that case became, you know, European practices. Um, if people agreed to change, you might integrate them by intermarrying, by uh, bringing them in as servants. If people didn't agree, then you shipped them somewhere else or uh, simply slaughtered them. Uh, and so the idea was that we had to document these cultures that were in danger of dying out before they died out. And in, in all honesty, this is not something that is only relegated to history. Um, we are in dire danger of loss of cultural diversity. Um, this is particularly prevalent in areas where there is still, let's say, relatively little um, contact per se. I mean, think about Brazil, right? Um, Brazil has over 500 different ethnic groups present in the country. However, 90% of Brazilians are genetically homogeneous, meaning that uh, Portuguese descent has uh, intermingled, Portuguese genetic ancestry has intermingled with all of those indigenous populations. Um, the Amazon itself holds a large uh, number of those at-risk populations. And Yet the fate of the Amazon really rests in the hands of the Brazilian nationalist government, which is a colonial institution. So there have been pushes in the past to build a dam called the Three Rivers Gorges um, that would flood a large part of the Amazon and displace about 180 different ethnic populations. Um, the, the ethnic groups of the Amazon rallied and showed up outside of uh, the the, the government buildings and held a protest to bring um, awareness to their plight. And then coronavirus happened. And so with the spread of the coronavirus, the novel coronavirus, um, you know, we've, we face a repeat of um, what has made it into kind of the uh, non-whitewashed history of America, um, the smallpox infected blankets. Um, the colonial entities deliberately uh, exposed blankets to smallpox and then uh, gave those as aid to uh, Native American populations, which then led to a disease outbreak that killed like over 180,000 people. So um, we have this potential with uh, people on the move and, and contact between um, you know, the Brazilian government and, and urban populations and these isolated groups in the Amazon that this could be another mass basically genocide um, due to the infection of the novel coronavirus. So we're still in danger of cultural loss. How do we cope with that? How do we uh, practice a discipline to record those cultural features, but then also fulfill our ethical obligations, which we'll come back to at the end of this lecture. All right, so we'll take some pauses at each of these thinking critically about anthropology slides. Um, this is where I will break up the lecture into its sub parts, so you don't have to listen to like 30 minutes to 40 minutes of uh, straight lecture. I want you to think about something that you do that feels natural, but is probably done somewhat differently by people of another cultural background. So um, for those of you who are part of this teacher education cohort, think about how students' cultural upbringing carries over into different ideas as they process and organize what they're learning in the classroom. Um, one case in point from my classroom this past year, um, we modeled the spread of a pandemic at the beginning of the year, not knowing, of course, that that would come to fruition uh, as time went on. Um, we had something called glow germ, which is a substance that um, shows up under UV light um, and also can be spread much like viruses and bacteria can uh, from like unwashed hands and stuff. And in one day we were able to contaminate about 96% of the school. Um, now my students were a little enthusiastic about it, like going up to people and rubbing their hands all over their faces, probably not normal 
behavior. I mean, we maybe should not put that much power in a group of 14 year old ninth graders, um, but definitely illustrating like how quickly things like viruses and bacteria can spread. Well, I've got one student who is Navajo. Um, and so we had an interesting conversation about um, healing and uh, kind of the role of Western medicine in mitigating outbreaks among indigenous populations. And um, this also brought to mind something I'd experienced probably, I mean, we're almost talking about like 20 years ago um, as a member of the New Mexico chapter for Tourette syndrome association. And um, we were trying to uh, reach out and um, kind of bring knowledge of diagnoses of Tourette's to native American populations, but we had to follow certain protocol. We had to work through their shamanistic healers before we were ever able to bring um, Western neurologists in to uh, work with the Navajo. So think about that in the scope of uh, the coronavirus pandemic and how much harder our Pueblos are being hit um, by the virus, how much higher their death rate is, um, and also kind of the difficulties of how do we bring awareness to and kind of combat against cultural practices. You know, this was prevalent in the Ebola outbreaks in the uh, the Central African Republic, for example, the Congo region, um, where you're asking people not to wash and go through ceremonies with their bodies, with the bodies of the dead, right? You're asking for them not to practice their funerary rites to minimize infection. Well, we're, we're kind of asking people to do that during coronavirus as well, right? Funerals can't be a group more than six people and only six if they live in the same household. So we are disrupting people's cultural practices in uh, in response to kind of this viral outbreak. So, um, but it doesn't have to be something that big, right? It doesn't have to be funerary rites. Think about food. What is your comfort food? Is your comfort food something like, I don't know, pozole? Uh, tamales, those kinds of things? Or is your comfort food something like macaroni and cheese um, or chicken noodle soup, right? We all have different food preferences that none are better than the others in the sense that they all fulfill the same purpose, right? They all bring us emotional comfort in a time of stress. They all nourish our bodies with calories and protein and carbs and fats and such. However, the food that we tend to crave, the food that we tend to associate with memories is going to be very strongly based uh, in our cultural upbringing.